and welcome to the Ashland branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library for our program today on IRS scams. We have with us today uh, AARP Community Ambassadors Martin Bailey and Trudy Morata to share with us the information. And so um, please take it away, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. And welcome to the uh, presentation. Let me get my share screen up. Like Carol said, today we're going to be talking about income tax frauds or, or IRS frauds. And what we're going to learn is basically how to protect ourselves against this. Now, there's really two things that we need to take away from this presentation on almost all presentations that I give on scams and frauds. And that is that all scams are based on our emotional uh, reaction to what the scammers are giving us. And the only two weapons we really have, no matter what type of uh, warnings I give you or red flags I say you have to look for. The only two weapons we really have against scams are our due diligence and our vigilance. Now when we talk about tax frauds, what we want to talk about is what a tax fraud looks like. What are the red flags or the warning signs that this may be a tax fraud? And also how to protect yourself against uh, tax frauds and these things that are coming up and just what you can do to, to protect yourself and pr protect others. Okay, the income tax fraud is any type of fraudulent activity that involves some kind of issue with either your taxes, your tax records, your tax return, something again dealing with the IRS. And again, it is some type of problem with that. A lot of the issues may include that you owe back taxes, that you have a refund due, there's some type of error in your tax records, or the worst one, which is going around right now during tax season, is the tax identity theft. And these attempts of fraud usually come in the form of maybe an email, a text message, a phone call, maybe a knock on the door. And the scammers right now are even using the U.S. Postal Service, which usually we always say the only time the federal government is going to contact you initially is going to be through the U.S. Postal Service. The scammers have obviously caught on to that, and they're doing the same thing now. Now, identity theft, when we talk about that, that is when the scammers steal your identity and they have enough information about you to submit a tax return in your name. A tax transcript scam, this is when the, uh, you'll get a uh, message from the quote IRS or the real scammers and they will tell you that you have an issue uh, usually with your tax transcript and a tax transcript is a document which records all your tax uh, payments that you've made, usually used when you're trying to get a loan or trying to get, get some type of government assistance. The tax transcript may also have other documents uh, with it. Say you have an issue with a tax return or you have an issue with this document or that document. Again, some type of issue with a document that the scammer wants you to do certain things with. And then of course the infamous imposter scam. And when we talk about the IRS imposter scam, scammer will contact you and say that they are from the IRS. They will be very professional about it. They will give you, uh, they may give you the name, an employee number, may even volunteer to send you a, uh, through the email or a fax, a copy of their government ID, their identification badge with the scammers are doing now. So they may do whatever it is to take to convince you that they are legitimate. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna say that you have a problem with, again, your tax return, that you owe taxes to the government, or they need some type of uh, verification on your information, your tax information in order to uh, pay you the uh, refund that you owe or to uh, make sure that they're processing your taxes right. So these are the three basic scams that uh, go around during tax season. And the, uh, the imposter scam and the uh, transcript scams can go on any time of the year. Uh, one of the questions we ask people is, you know, do you or have you filed your taxes yet? Yes or no. Uh, so far, we usually get about a 50-50 uh, uh, response on this right here. About 50% say yes, they filed their taxes. 50% uh, say no, they haven't. And the reason why we ask this question, you'll find out later on, that it's very important to file your taxes as soon as possible. Okay, when identity theft strikes, what happens is, Again, a fraudulent tax return is uh, sent in your name. Now, what happens is taxpayers usually delay in filing. 
And a lot of times you'll see on you know the April 15th date, all these people are cramming in the post office trying to mail their uh, taxes in or they're uh, cramming the internet, clogging the internet up, trying to get their electronic taxes in. So a lot of people, for whatever reason, delay in filing their taxes. And the scammers know this and the scammers are gonna take advantage of this. Now, one of the things that the IRS attempts to do is they attempt to pay taxes or pay your refund within say a three week or a 21 day time frame. So once you file in about 21 days or so, hopefully you will be getting your refund back. Uh, and the victim files the tax return. This is how you start knowing that you've got a problem. When a victim, when you file your tax return and the IRS refuses to, refuses to process it and may send you some type of communication that you've already filed it and you've already got your return. Now here's what you have to look out for. When you file a return, the IRS sends you a notice indicating that you've already filed it and a refund's already been sent to you. That's a big red flag saying, okay, you probably have identity theft uh, done on your on your taxes. Okay, the next one, if you get a, a letter from the IRS, which is a potential identity theft. So the IRS has recognized that you are probably a victim of identity theft and they've sent you this, this letter telling you this. You now have to contact the IRS and work through this identity theft issue. And then third one, uh, a big red flag is when the IRS notifies you and tells you that you failed to declare all your income. This will usually happen when somebody has declared unemployment using your name and the unemployment commission files that uh, document to the state or to the IRS and the IRS marries it up with your taxes and say, okay, you did not claim this. And they notify you and saying, hey, you've not claimed uh, all, your, all your income. So if you receive one of these types of notices from the IRS or your tax uh, state authorities, state tax authorities, chances are your identity has been stolen. Okay, how to protect yourself? And this was the reason for the question. You wanna file your return as early as possible. As soon as you've got all your paperwork together, uh, either electronically file it, do it yourself, get with your tax preparer and have them do it, but file it as early as possible. So the scammers cannot take advantage of of that time lag in there. Once you filed your report or your uh, tax uh, information, you wanna to go to the site uh, www.irs.gov slash refund. Give about uh, maybe three or four or five days for the, if you mail it for the, ref or for the uh, tax return to get to the IRS and then start checking on this particular website to find out what the status is. The IRS will show that they've received it, it's in process, or when the refund is actually uh, sent to you or anything else that may be happening to your, particular to your particular return. So this is a real good site that you're able to track your refund or your tax documentation with the IRS. The other one is know your tax preparer. Uh, what we talk about there is when you pick, choose somebody to do your taxes, have they been recommended by somebody else? Have you checked them out? Did you check their tax preparer ID out with the, with the IRS to make sure they're legitimate, that they're in good standing with the IRS? Have you checked the Better Business Bureau? If they're uh, associated with, say, uh, one of the tax preparer companies, have you checked the company out to find, number one, are they in fact an employee? Uh, number two, what's your standing with the company? What is the company rate? If you've been able to walk into their office, how is your office, is your office neat? Are there any papers laying around that you can look on their desk and find a social security number for somebody? So this is what you're looking for for your tax preparer. Uh, have they been recommended by anybody? What type of rating do they have? And, you know, go on social media, find out, are they on there anywhere? Has there ever been anything uh, derogatory about them? So this is what you wanna look for because when you hand that information to that tax preparer, he has your total identity. He or she has your total identity that they can do anything with. And hopefully they're legit and all they're gonna do is prepare your taxes. Now, if you discover that, or you suspect that you have a uh, subject of a tax, tax ID problem uh, or your ID has been compromised, you'll wanna go on the IRS website and fill out the identity theft affidavit and report that to the IRS. In addition to that, you'll also wanna report, go to the FTC identity theft.gov and report uh, that your identity has been stolen and see how you can work to get your identity back. Again, how to protect your identity. Keep all your documents secure and shred them when they're no longer needed. Now, when we say all your documents secure, this includes the ones you're working on at home, 
if you're working on your taxes, at the end of the day, you haven't finished them yet, still pack all your stuff up and make sure it's secure so nobody can walk by your desk or dining room table and look to see what you're doing and get any information off those pieces of paper. So again, make sure all your documents are secure. And one other thing is shred them when they're no longer needed. Uh, get with your CPA, your tax preparer, or your accountant and find out when you can um, actually be safe in shredding those documents. If you go online, you'll get uh, three, five, and seven year time frames, depending on what type of taxes you've submitted. But again, if you want a professional uh, opinion, get with your CPA, your tax preparer, and find out how long should you really keep the documents that you use to prepare your taxes on. Uh, protect your ID or identity online. Again, if you're on social media, if you do any type of uh, cruising online, you want to make sure your identity is protected. You want to make sure you have good anti-software on your machine. And this is all your machines to include your mobile devices and keep it uh, updated. You also make sure that you want to use uh, complex passwords. And in fact, what we recommend is use a passphrase instead of a password. So you could use a passphrase like, uh, you know, my aunt lives in Pennsylvania. Easy for you to remember. It's going to be harder for the scammer to get on. Get on. Also, you'll want to mix your phrases or your passwords up with capitals and small letters, numerals, and symbols. And also, you'll want to use two-factor authentication when it is available. And most financial institutions now have the two-factor identification out or authentication out. In fact, there are some that once you log into them, they make it mandatory that you use the two-factor authentication. And when you do that, it will they'll ask you uh, how you want these special codes sent back to you. you. Usually have it texted to you, emailed to you, or on a telephone call. And when you do log in to your account, you use your user ID and password, the organization will come back and ask you how you want your code sent to you. You get a say through text, you get a, so a six digit code, you enter that, and then you can get onto your website. Uh, also, you want to learn how to recognize phishing and imposter emails. If you Google, uh, something like IRS phishing emails or IRS imposter emails. Uh, the sites will come up. You'll get several uh, different type of uh, examples there. Some of them will even have red flags pointing at the different things that you want to look at on these emails. Again, you'll want to get a feel for what these fake emails look like. And same thing with text messages. One of the things the IRS has come up with now is in January of this year, they have what's called the IRS Identity Protection PIN opt-in program. It used to be the only time you got the PIN is if you had an issue with your taxes and they would issue you a PIN. Now they'll issue it to anybody as long as you have a social security number and a taxpayer identification number. It's a six digit number that they will give you. Uh, when you log on immediately this year, it will be given to you immediately so you can, so you can do your taxes. And every year it has to be updated. And this helps the IRS verify your tax return along with your social security number and everything. You have that number on it. It helps them uh, identify it as a legitimate tax return and their, their ability to accept it. Okay, in order to get the PIN online, all I have to do is go to like IRS uh, IP PIN. Uh, you can Google it and see the bottom line here, IRS identification PIN, and you'll get the IRS site. Again, go on the site. You can fill out the information. One thing you want to make sure of that uh, you can uh, do it over the internet, and that's the secure access authentication. And if you go to that particular site there, which is on the IRS site, it will tell you what you need in order to do it online. Okay, another quiz that we had is what things sh uh, should you not normally carry with you? And we list a couple things out there, passwords pin and PIN numbers. Uh, pictures of your significant others, one or two credit cards, social security card, Medicare card, driver's license, passport and passport ID cards. And what we're looking for there is in your wallet or port purse, what should you not have in it or not normally have in it? And of course, of course the correct answer is passwords and PIN numbers. You should not carry those with you. If you have them at home written down, you want to make sure they are in a secure location. Uh, there's no reason. Uh, and you can use a password manager uh, there are several out there. Uh, do your own research to find out which one that you feel is the best one out there. Uh, picture of your significant other. Yes, you can definitely carry that. 
Uh, one person asked me, is it okay to carry a picture of your pet? Yes, you can carry pictures of your pets also. Uh, one or two credit cards, what we're looking at there is a lot of people will tend to carry five, six, seven, eight credit cards. You might have one for Home Depot, you might have one for Lowe's, you might have one for Hex, uh, you might have one or two MasterCards. And the question is, why are you carrying so many credit cards? Are you in fact going to Lowe's, Hex, uh, and where, where, what other, other store credit cards you have? Are you actually going to go to all those stores today that you're going to use those credit cards? Are you really just going to go to work or go out, maybe buy gas, go shopping at uh, your food store and come back home? So you really only need one credit card, maybe carry a second one as a backup. Uh, social security card, you never have to carry your social security card unless you need it for identification. Uh, if you're, uh, say you got a new employment and your HR people need to uh, verify your identi identification, they may ask for your secure, uh, social security card. If you're getting security clearance, they may ask for your social security card. But other than that, I uh, recommend keeping it locked up in a safe at home. Medicare card, uh, same thing. You do not have to carry your Medicare card with you. The 1986 uh, Emergency Treatment and Labor uh, Act basically says that if a hospital has an emergency room and accepts government funding, they have to at least stabilize you, which means they do it without any proof of insurance. So as far as carrying your Medicare card with you, unless you know you're going to see the doctor today, you do not need to carry it. That, again, is a personal choice. I recommend not carrying it. You can take a copy of your Medicare card, cross off the number, put it on the reverse side in case of emergency, call my significant other. And by the time they stabilize you, they will have hopefully have your significant other on the phone and they can they will be giving you or that person will be giving the Medicare card number or card number to the uh, hospital who's, give, who's giving you care. Again, personal choice on that one. Driver's license. Yes, of course, if you're going to be driving, you want to drive, take that with you. And passport or passport card, uh, only if you're uh, leaving the country or you're traveling abroad. Also, if you're on the border between uh, Mexico and the United States or Canada and the United States, you'll want to take your, you know, usually a passport card will work in both countries. So you can have that with you. Other than that, it's recommended that you leave your passport at home and again, locked up in a safe. Okay, again, how to protect yourself. We recommend do not give out any type of personal information unless you know who's asking for it. What we recommend is unless you've made initial contact with that person and you know who they are, who they work for, why they're asking for your personal information, what the personal information is going to be used for, and even as far as how they store that personal information is what you want, what you want to make sure before you give out any personal information. And personal information can be anything from your email address to your birthday to your uh, actual physical address at home. Any type of personal information, we recommend that Again, you made initial contact with the person and you know why they want it. Uh, when you get either text messages or email messages, we recommend do not click on any type of links or do not open any attachments unless, again, you are certain who sent it, why they sent it to you, and what the attachment contains. If Trudy would send me an email out of the blue and say, hey, Martin, you've got to look at this attachment, I'd probably give her a call or text her and ask her, did you send me an email with an attachment on it? Now, one of the things, if you notice, I say I either give her a call or text her if she sent me an email. You do not want to send or do not want to verify the, uh, the uh, attachment or the person that sent this to you in the same way they sent you the information. You'll want to verify it in some other means. So if they send me a text, I want to do it through email or telephone call. And again, do not carry your Social Security card unless absolutely necessary. Can you not enter personal financial information on the website unless you know it is secure? You can go to your secure websites and you'll see an HTTPS or a little padlock uh, icon up there. You know that's a secure site. However, scammers will also have sites that have the HTTPS or padlock. So unless you've actually logged into that site and you know for a fact that that is the site that you've always logged into and that is your credit union or your banking site, then I would highly recommend that you not just log into a site that somebody sent you through an email. Even if it's an email saying, you know, hey, this is your bank and we know we're notifying you because of this, log in here. Do not log in there. Go to your, go to the, you know what the site is and, log, and type that site information in. Do not use the email or the text messages that they sent you. 
uh, you want do not when you use when you're out to Starbucks or a hotel, you don't want to use public Wi-Fi when using anything that's password protected, or you're given personal financial information over the over Wi-Fi. Uh, if you look at Wi-Fi, and this is where we're going to get to that virtual private network. If you look at Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, look at it as a uh, interstate highway with the data flowing. There's your cars on it, and that's the data, and it's flowing back and forth. And all the scammers are doing is looking to see what data is out there, and they're going to pick up one of the pieces of data, maybe change it around a little bit, see where it's going to, see some information on it, and put it back on the highway and let it go its happy way. The scammer can take literally take your transaction, and if you're depositing money into your bank account, change it into their bank account and let it go. Okay, so this is what uh, uh, unprotected or the public Wi-Fi looks like. When you use a virtual private network, and you can get the virtual private networks, a lot of your antivirus uh, software that you use on your computers and your personal uh, mobile devices have a VPN on it. Highly recommend that you use a VPN or that you get a VPN through some other source and use that VPN. And what that does is that basically puts a tunnel around your, your data. So you're sending your data up, but now the scammers can't see it because you, you have, it's going through a tunnel. Instead of on an open highway, it's now a tunnel. Uh, can that be breached? Yes. Scammers can breach anything, but again, this is an added level of security. And look at all these uh, added levels of security as building the wall, and we're just adding more and more bricks into the wall, so make it harder for the scammer to get to us. Okay. Uh, the tax transcript scams, how that works is a scammer is going to claim that they're from the IRS, and they're going to send you an email and they're going to say that attached is either a tax transcript or some other tax documents. And the subject line, you're going to see the transcript or whatever tax document they're sending you. It may have some type of urgent action required or action required, something like that there. Now, the transcript, in case a lot of people don't know what it is, it is a summary of all your tax returns. And people that are applying for loans or government assistance, sometimes the organizations they're applying to will ask the IRS for this uh, transcript. And what this does, it shows them that you are in fact paying all your taxes, you're timely in paying your taxes, gives them an idea of, of what your income level is or was. So it gives them a feel for, again, how credit worthy you are, just another thing that they can check out. But again, a very important document uh, that, the, uh, like I said, the loan organizations use, the government uh, organizations use, to assess your credit worthiness. Uh, again, uh, the tax scammers may put that on, on the email, tell you, hey, it's attached, download it because you have an issue with it. Okay, it will either have the transcript or we'll have another document. Again, it's an attachment and the message is gonna say, whatever's attached, it needs immediate attention. So you have to open it, download it and open it and make whatever corrections are needed to that particular document. As soon as you click it and download it, if you open it, chances are you're going to be loading malware onto your computer. Now, malware is some type of virus that's either going to take over your computer, uh, gather all your personal information on, that's on your computer, send it to the scammer. Uh, it may hold your computer for ransom. It will basically tell you that, you know, I have, or the scammer now has your computer. In order to get your computer back, you have to pay so much money to us. So it can do various things to your computer. Again, if you download that attachment, uh, or even on a text, if you click that URL on the text, it will usually download some type of malware on your device. And that the malware can do anything from uh, holding, your device to, holding your device to ransom, to taking all the information off, off your device, to even do things that you do not know what's doing. It can use your uh, device as a node to send out other information or other emails to other people and you don't even know what's happening. So these are things that you have to watch out for. Again, do not open that device or the attachment. It's going to probably contain malware, infect your computer. The best thing to do is delete the email. Uh, if you want to, you can send it to phishing at irs.gov. Send them a copy of the email. And what the, what the government does is they look at these emails and they try to find okay, where they're coming from. And if they can build up enough data they might be able to stop this type of email from happening, or at least this type of e email from happening from that particular scammer. Now, remember, the IRS nor any of the federal government agencies 
will not send you any unsolicited emails, uh, nor when they send you the email, are they going to attach any type of sensitive information to that email. Okay, another question we have is, would you answer a phone call that when you look on your uh, 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 identification thing, your display, that it says, you know, it displays IRS, and it gives you the 1-800-829-1040 number. The question is, do you answer the call? So far, again, it's uh, split usually between 50-50. We had one presentation that I think everybody said no except for one person. And that is outstanding because no, you do not want to answer the phone calls because the scammers can spoof that number. They can spoof the ID that it will display IRS and give you that phone number. Okay. How the uh, IRS imposter scam works. And this particular one, I'm going to give you here, really this imposter scam, if you change the IRS to Medicare, to Social Security, to your local uh, law enforcement agency, basically works the same way for all your imposters, okay? The scammer is going to claim that they are from the IRS. They, they may give you their employee number, their name. They may give you a phone number to call back on to verify this. They may give you uh, the section that they work for. They will be very professional. They may even start a conversation. Now, remember, we said they work on our emotions, and they may even start a conversation with you where all your answers will be positive, and what they're trying to build is some type of bond, a trusting emotional bond with you so that you will trust them so that you don't think they're going to be lying to you later on. So this is something that a really good scammer may do, may take a few minutes of his time and do this. And then they'll go into the scam. The scammer may claim that, hey, you owe back taxes. And what they do is they, or they may demand that you, uh, you have to pay these back taxes, but you have to pay them immediately or there may be some type of action taken against you. When you pay them, you either have to pay them through a uh, debit card, a uh, gift card, or wire transfer. Usually the way they're going to ask you to pay it is basically untraceable. So once that money's gone, it's gone, and the chance of you getting back is slim to none. Okay, another thing they'll do is they'll say they're going to, uh, some type of threat. They may have a, a arrest warrant out for you. Uh, the sheriff is on their way right now. The only way they can stop the sheriff from getting to you and arresting you is if you pay them. Uh, the, they may say they're going to sue you if you don't pay them immediately. Uh, they may say they're going to take your driver's license or they're going to suspend your, uh, I, or your uh, Social Security benefits or your Medicare benefits. And for those of us that have these benefits, they can be very, very important to us and, again, put us in emotionally a panic-type mode so that we are emotionally upset and we're going to start doing what the scammer tells us to do. So they're going to do things like that. They may even tell you that they're going to deport you. We had one lady that actually was told that they're going to de deport her. And she responded, it's going to be hard to deport me because I was born in Brooklyn. So, you know, you'll have the scammers. The scammers really don't care what they're telling you as long as they feel they can get you emotionally upset. And again, line number four. They're playing on your fears and your emotions, and that's all they're playing on. If you notice throughout the presentation, I've never asked you what college you graduated from, what your GAP or what your uh, grade point average was, uh, if you went to high school, or if you graduated high school. I never asked you anything about that. I never asked you what your IQ was. I don't care, or the scammers don't care how intelligent you are. All the scammers care about is can they get you emotionally involved with them, and they get, can they cause some type of fear in you to get you to do what they want you to do. Now, again, when you talk about the government imposter calls, most of these are going to be robo calls. And the robo call is going to leave a message, or you know, if you answer it, it's going to say, you know, this is the IRS or whatever government agency it is. And if you press one, you will get, or there's some type of trouble with your documentation. If you press one, you'll get a live agent who can help you through this, this problem. Or if you press two, uh, we won't, we'll no longer call you again. What happens is you press one, you'll get a live agent who will again try to scam you. If you press two, what that does is that lets the scammer know there's a human being at the end of the line, continue calling them. Sooner or later, they may answer. Uh, so they're basically again lying to you as far as you pressing two. If it goes to voicemail, again, you, if it's a legitimate call, they will leave a voice message. 
Sometimes the scammers will leave a voice message. And again, we we'll want you to check that voice message out, verify it through another source. Okay. When you say that you know, the person's from the IRS, they give you a phone number, call the phone number that you know is the IRS that you've used before. Call that number up and tell the IRS person that you get on that end of the line that, hey, I just got a call from the IRS. I got a call from this agent. Are you, in fact, looking for me? And they will, find, they will be able to find out, one, if they're looking for you, and two, if that's a real agent. So they can tell you this information, whether or not you've been scammed. So these are the things you want to do. Again, you want to uh, use your due diligence to back up or to uh, find out all these things that you can before you actually uh, start uh, calling people back or emailing people back. Another thing what they'll do is they'll ask for verification. Again, you may receive a text message, email, or telephone call and tell you that they need to verify personal information from you. They have a, uh, an overpayment that you've done. They need to reimburse you. They want to double check to make sure that this is the right person that they're talking to. If you could give, you, give us your name, your birthday, your social security number, and oh yes, let us know what your bank account is so that we can send the check to your bank account. So not only now that they have your identification, now they got your bank account that they will, uh, they will obviously not send anything to it, but they will take money from it. Uh, so there you have what the verification is. Again, if you get a message like this, you need to verify who it's coming from. Okay, how to protect yourself. Remember the IRS or other government agencies will not call you. They will not contact you by email. Uh, the IRS especially will contact you several times by uh, U.S. Postal Service before taking any other type of action on you. If for some reason you do not uh, answer their uh, snail mail or their Postal Service mail, they do have, uh, I think, of three agencies that they will contact and uh, they are con 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 contracted with that will actually come out and knock on your door and say, well, by the way, the IRS has been trying to contact you. Here's a letter that they, they've been trying to contact you with. And they will have proper identification. Again, uh, but this is several times the IRS has tried to contact you before they actually do something like that. Uh, if you are called and the caller starts in immediately into the scam, you stop the caller and you ask them for their name, their badge number, and a callback number, hang up on them, and then verify it. If it is a legitimate agent that called you up, say you made initial contact with the IRS for some reason, and they give you a call back, uh, again, you may want to verify it. The IRS agents know that you may want to verify it and understand that here's my name, here's my badge number, here's a callback number, hang up on me, please do so, verify it, and then you can talk to me later when you, you know, call up later. So they understand that this is going to happen to you. Again, you want to, uh, you may want to Google like fraudulent IRS email messages, get an idea what these messages look like. Again, there'll be uh, several sites out there. They'll actually have a message uh, constructed and actually have little red flags that are on the message to look for, like addresses. You know, they say it's from the IRS, but when you look at the address, it's from Google Mail or from Gmail. So why is the IRS using Gmail? If you run your mouse over the URL, it's supposed to take you to the IRS site and you look down at the bottom of the screen and the URL doesn't go to the IRS site, it goes somewhere else. Or another thing you want to be careful of, if you run your mouse over the URL and there's at the bottom of the screen, there's a very short URL. We recommend absolutely do not connect on or uh, contact that URL. That is probably a scam. What it uh, is, it's shorthand, uh, technical shorthand to write a URL. Uh, instead of the long URL, they make it a short URL and it's very hard to distinguish where that URL goes. How to protect yourself some more, no federal agency. And it's usually includes state and local government agencies are not going to accept payment by wire transfer, Bitcoin, or Bitcoin gift card, or anything like that. If you get a request to pay like that, it's almost always 100% scam. Uh, we verify the number on the letter you get. And I noticed the number I have here, the 800 number, is a valid IRS number. Or go to their IRS website to verify it again. Now, no government agency is going to threaten you over the phone, either with suspension of services or any deportation or anything like that. They all want to work some type of, of uh, agreement out with you, either to pay your taxes or to alleviate whatever problem you may be facing. 
they will work something out with you uh, and they'll be more than happy to work, work with you on these things. So they're not going to threaten you with any type of legal action uh, until they've actually tried to work with you some way, try to get, get you to, again, work with you some way to do that. Uh, again, do not make any type of media payment. Never pay by wire, Bitcoin, or prepaid debt card. Uh, do not trust the name on the phone ID. They can spoof it. And do not click on any links in email or text messages to verify your information. Okay, again, if you get a get a call, uh, do not press any numbers. Let it go to uh, the voicemail. If you get an, uh, a live agent, recommend that you hang up. And if they are, in fact, looking for you, call them up to verify they are. And we recommend absolutely do not engage. Let it go to voicemail. And if you think you owe taxes, uh, that's the legitimate number there for the IRS and also the uh, irs.gov slash balance due will be able to uh, make or contact the IRS to find out if you, in fact, you do owe taxes. Okay, what you can do to protect yourself some more, if you feel your uh, identity has been stolen, you can go to that particular phone number there, and that's 4488. I'm sorry, 4484 uh, is the correct number on that one there. Uh, also go to the IRS theft identity form on the IRS line. Uh, you can uh, file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. What I would recommend if you go to the Federal Trade Commission in the bottom one, that identitytheft.gov, you'll want to go on that particular site just to look at the site. It's a very good site and a lot of good information on that site. Uh, a lot of the, your uh, federal sites, your FTC, your FBI, your Security Exchange Commission, they all have uh, information on scams and highly recommend that you go to some of these sites just to get a feel for the scams. And AARP uh, Fraud Watch Network has a good, good site that has a lot of scams on it. It shows you what the scams are and the do's and you, you don'ts behind the scams. Uh, the other thing you want to do is do a local police report. Some local uh, police departments do not have the ability to do a fraud report or identity theft report. So you'll want to kick it up to the next level, maybe the sheriff's department or maybe a state, state, state police department. Again, you'll want to get some type of law enforcement report that your identity has been compromised. And the first one of the first things you really want to do is they put a fraud alert or a security freeze on your credit reports. This way here, this will stop scammers from trying to get into your credit report and trying to establish uh, new credit cards on you, trying to uh, look at your credit report to possibly get loans that uh, loan companies may need to check your report on. So this is what you want to do. You put an alert or a freeze on it. If you do an alert, if your identity has been stolen, what they'll want is a uh, police report. Well, all you have to do is call one of the credit agencies to put the fraud alert on. It's usually good for one year. It costs you nothing. But when you do the fraud alert, if somebody wants to check your credit, they'll alert the credit bureau. The bureau, the bureau will alert you, and all, all you have to do is say yes, and the credit bureau will open up, the, open up your credit account. On a security freeze, you have to request from all three credit bureaus that your, your accounts be frozen. When you do, they will give you a password, and if somebody wants to look at your credit report, the credit company will tell you that they want to look at your report and then only you can release that report. The credit bureau cannot release that report. So when they give you that particular password, recommend you do not uh, lose that password. Also, if you go to the uh, Federal Trade Commission website and put down fraud alert or credit freeze, you'll get a very good explanation of what they are. You'll get the phone numbers. You'll get how to do it. It's a really good explanation of how to work through that process of either alert or freezes on your on your credit bureau. Okay, again, if you're unsure it's a scam or if you've been victimized, you can call our Fraud Watch Network helpline at 877-908-3360. What you'll do, you'll get one of the, either an AARP uh, employee or you'll get one of our volunteers. They will take your information. They will either try to help you out online while you're on the phone or they'll take your information and they will pass that on to other volunteers like Trudy or myself, and we will give you a call and try to work and work, work your way through your identity theft or whatever type of uh, scam that you've been a victim of. 
will tell you what to do, uh, phone numbers to call and things like that, and basically try to help you out to uh, get you out of that scam situation. Okay, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Hopefully we passed on some good information. If you need to contact me, uh, please email Carol or give Carol a call. She's got my email address, she can get with me. If you have any questions, again, you can ask Carol. She can send them over to me and I can uh, either give you a call or email you and uh, let you know what the answers are. Again, thank you for joining us. Hope you got some good information. And right now, Carol, I wanna thank you for uh, having us again today. Well, thank you, Martin and, and Trudy both. Uh, I know Trudy's the, the uh, light behind the screen sometimes. And uh, uh, even if she doesn't say a whole lot, she, she's uh, important support there. And I thank you both for all this wonderful information. I do want to tell our audience that uh, Martin has provided a handout for this that will be attached to the end of this recording so that you will have that available. And yes, you can contact me at the uh, Pamunkey Regional Library if you have questions for uh, Martin and Trudy. Uh, again, I want to thank you for coming and joining us today and let you know that uh, my name is Carol and I'm at the Ashland branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library. And uh, we hope you will enjoy this program and look, keep, keep an eye on our website for other interesting and uh, exciting programs coming to you from the library. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Carol.